Thanks very much to the organisers of Politics in the Pub. I do acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay tribute to their history, their culture and their ongoing contributions to our community. I've been asked tonight, and it's good to join Rod. Um, Rod and I haven't spoken on a platform together for a while, so it's good to be here together. We've been asked to speak on Bernie Sanders' democratic and ecological socialism in the US. Um, after I've covered these subjects, I will um, include implications for the left pol for left politics and particularly the growth of social movements. I've got to say I found Bernie Sanders' campaign extraordinary. I didn't think in my lifetime I would see somebody running for the US presidential race to talk about socialism, but there it was. Um, and I do think it's significant. Yes, there's criticisms that we can make of Sanders, criticisms of his platforms, but there's a lot to be positive about. And I think for the left, considering the divisions, um, the setbacks and the, let's be frank about it, the lack of achievements in recent decades, um, often the arguments and the splits, when you look at them, are they really necessary? Because overall, I think there was more to be positive about um, Sanders' campaign and particularly how it helped drive social movements that is so critical and much we can learn from. So in many ways, I um, think that the um, failings of capitalism have been laid bare um, more and more because of um, these developments. Um, the objective conditions have given rise to leaders like Corbyn and Sanders and movements across Europe and Latin America that articulate the mood of the people. So the mood is there. Can we keep um, the rise of social movements going? But first off, um, Sanders, like many others, has been a consistent voice for years. I do acknowledge that for social change. He's one of those politicians who would turn up. People often make fun of him. He's an old bloke and he turns up and makes the same speech. But you'd have to say that it has um, delivered many important outcomes. Now, Sanders and Co Corbyn phenomenon was not about isolated individuals suddenly capturing the imaginations of millions of people around the world. Our movements build on each other. There are periods where change appears minimal or non-existent. And I just made those comments that I don't think that um, our achievements have been huge. However, I still acknowledge the importance of those movements, whether it's been single issue campaigns or the wider social movements. And maybe it's not as strong as what many of us grew up at the end of the last century, the um, women's movement, the what was called gay liberation, the environment movement, the peace movement. But still, there has been social movements in recent times that are most significant and I think have laid that foundation for what we're now seeing come forward. Now, I did want to take up, um, just go into some of the issues about ecological socialism and democratic socialism, uh, because it was um, an aspect of um, Sanders' campaign. Now, ecological socialism has a fine history. It, um, it advocates, um, um, those who advocate for it have written extensively about dismantling capitalism. They've identified that private ownership is the basis of the destruction of the natural environment. The focus of ecological socialists on common ownership of the means of production, from what I can see, was not adopted by Sanders in terms of his language. But when you look at his platform, it is very similar in what it would deliver in expanding the concept of the commons for the, for the, for the public good. Eco-socialists have used various grassroots strategies to mobilise individuals into collective networks working to transform society through non-violent action. And when you consider how the Sanders campaign, campaign played out with mass actions and involvement, and involvement, the style of work of ecologi ecological socialism is certainly reflected in the Sanders campaign. Now, just moving on to democratic social, um, socialism and how Sanders um, handled that. Now, I'll actually start off with a long quote. I usually, and this is a really long quote, um, I usually don't like doing that in speeches, but I did find it interesting and wanted to make some comments on it. Um, this comes from a November 2015 speech of Sanders um, given at Georgetown University. And he said, in his inaugural remarks in January 1937, in the midst of the Great Depression, 
President Franklin D. Delano Roosevelt looked out at the nation and this is what he saw. He saw tens of millions of citizens denied the basic necessities of life. He saw millions of families trying to live on income so meagre that the pall of family disaster hung over them day by day. He saw one third of a nation ill-housed, ill-clad, ill-nourished, and he acted against the ferocious opposition of the ruling class of his day, people he called economic royalists. Roosevelt implemented a series of programs that put millions of people back to work, took them out of poverty and restored their faith in government. And that is what we have to do today. And by the way, almost everything he proposed was called socialist. Social security, which transformed life for the elderly in this country, was socialist. The concept of the minimum wage was seen as a radical intrusion into the marketplace and was described as socialist. Democratic socialism means we must create an economy that works for all, not just the very wealthy. Democratic socialism means that we must reform a political system in America today, which is not only grossly unfair, but in many respects corrupt. Now, I actually think this whole speech is well worth reading. You could find it quite easily. So was he a socialist? Because I know that's been picked over quite a bit. But I think when you make, um, reflect on the history of the US like that, um, and you reflect on what he campaigned with, yes, we could sit here for a week criticising what he did, but there is this positive aspect. And I really want to give emphasis to this because so often the left has had these battles over what is the right line, what is the way we should work. And I think they're important discussions, but they shouldn't be allowed to divide us. And when we have leaders, particularly I've got to say in the US, as I said before, I never thought I'd see this. And here he is speaking in this way. I do think it's significant. So yes, it's far from perfect. And yes, much of the program in the current objective conditions would be difficult to achieve. But Sanders' platform, his speeches, his campaign turned into a mass, mass mobilisation. And mass movements are critical to progressive change. That, that is really the essence of what we, where we now are at. And considering the challenge the left, left currently faces, it's worth examining the Sanders experience. Now, I did just want to add a couple more in, um, points about how Sanders work before I go on to about the social movements. Because uh, I found these qu quite interesting just in terms of some policy detail. Sanders' um, demands, um, what he stood for, were based on two principles, universality and visibility. Now, that is that the education and health programs, for instance, should have universal application. And how he described this, and this might help get across one of his points, is that Donald Trump's children should enjoy access to free um, education, but Donald Trump should pay his full and fair taxes to pay for that education. And <laughs> they certainly need the education. I, ta I take the interjection as spot on. Um, the principle of universality helps our campaigning because it reshapes outcomes. And just to say that well, I'm fortunate to have the housing portfolio for the Greens. And that's one of the things that we're campaigning for is universal housing, homes for all. Because it gets past what's happened to housing in terms of it's just being totally commodified in the society. It's become like another form of money. And so this universal approach to those basic rights that all people should access to I think is an important step. Uh, then he, um, the second principle Sanders campaigned about, um, campaigned on, um, campaigned to um, as a basis for his policies was visibility. Now visibility um, is not in the first instance about running a high profile campaign. That's what he's not initially talking about. Visibility refers to the policy details of what we stand for being visible in terms of being accessible and most importantly, clearly understood. Like so much, like the welfare state was once a huge achievement. It's now been um, balkanised to a point where it's, it's hard for people to understand it. Just about impossible to work through what your rights are. So when it comes to welfare programs, for example, they should be designed so recipients can easily understand what the programs do, how they benefit from them and how they can access them. 
but we see with aged care, pensions, students, um, uh, um, assistance, it's not readily understandable. You don't know where the hidden costs are, where even sometimes people aren't sure where, where to apply, um, who, who you can get help from, are they means tested? So this is a very real aspect of the sort of things that we do need to address. So that's just a rundown on some uh, reflections on Sanders and how it played out in recent times, particularly with regard to ecological, uh, and de ecological socialism and democratic socialism. Now, I think Sanders um, ran on a great platform, as I said, and we know in politics, inspiring ideas and a vision for a fair and ju just future um, can drive change. For the left, we know progressive change comes from the rise of social movements, and that's what I wanted to now deal, deal with. This is where we need to consider the objective conditions that provided the context for the improvements um, around Sanders and Corbyn. Movements, um, of, movements in the main of young people, but not just of young people. But the younger generation, I think it's worth noting, they didn't grow up with the Cold War. The capitalism that they've grown up with, they're now seeing is deeply tarnished. It's not as though it was something that they had to hang on um, to because of past divisions. But the Cold War is gone from the memory bank of so many um, people. And what are they seeing? The planet cooking, housing um, being out, out, of, out of reach. Uh, like 2.3 million people are under housing stress, which means that they're like one disaster away from the slippery slope to homelessness. Uh, no exaggeration. Kids get sick, you, um, you lose your job, you've got to stay home and look after your elderly parents, um, or, or you yourself get sick. You, know, you can't afford your payments. So you know, the, the, this crisis is so close for so many people. Uh, so it adds up to life is a real burden. So more people now recognise, particularly young people, that society has problems, deep problems. Um, and so many of those problems come straight out of how the, what goes on in corporate boardrooms. I mean, certainly out of what comes out of um, the likes of the Turnbull government. But the Turnbull government is there delivering the e easy path for the corporate world. And the corporate world is being nailed as the cause of so many of, of the problems that we face. So the deep contradictions of capitalism are now on display on a daily basis. Now, I do acknowledge that capitalism has fostered an innovative approach in some areas of human endeavour, but the right reliance, its reliance on gross inequality and exploitation is proving socially and environmentally disastrous. Austerity, a favoured policy of neoliberalism, is now seen as a policy of extreme abuse. And the tide is turning on politics, but where it will lead us is unclear. And I think all of us have a role um, in this. Discussions like this, I think, are very important. For those of us committed to urgent climate action, wealth redistribution, homes for all, and free health and education, working to support and encourage the growth of social movements is vital. The more people question the legitimacy of the entire capitalist system, the better. People are asking why a nation's income is not distributed in a society in a fair way. Why the rich gets richer. I mean, we want to encourage those discussions and it is happening more. The momentum of social movements has united people across generations. There is a real question about the future of these movements, however. Will they peter out, as the anti-globalisation movement did, tragically after the 2001 uh, attack on the Twin Towers? The consideration of the future of the left and social movement also raises the question of the interaction of the left with social democratic parties, in our case, um, the Labor Party. Now, the left in Australia has had a very conflicted relationship with Labor for uh, over 100 years. It's just part of our history. And what essentially that is, why that is, is because Labor in opposition is a very different beast from when it is in government. Uh, and you see this time and time again, and we're seeing, seeing it right now. And let's remember what has happened in government. In 1949, Labor, a Labor government put the troops in to destroy um, a strike of coal workers. And then we've got private school funding, we've got the motorways that are carving up Sydney, let's remember, um, so much of that was um, Labor policy. But I do acknowledge, I'm in no way equating Labor with the Liberals and Nationals, I do acknowledge that in um, 
Melbourne and in Perth, in Western Australia, they um, Labor changed their position on motorways after massive social movements for public transport and actually cancelled the contracts. And again, it shows the strength and why we need to build those social movements. Uh, but, yeah, and just, but just going back to the problems with Labor in government, Ian MacDonald, Obeed, Tripodi. Like, you know, there's a penetration of the likes of those people into government using it for their own self-interest. But right now, Labor is in opposition at a federal level, and what we're seeing for Shorten appears to be that he's a standard bearer for fighting inequality. Um, and the plans, they're talking about plans for housing affordability, curtailing trusts that deliver so much money to those who already have great wealth, and more corporate taxes. So is this real? What is the response to the left when Labor are like this? So I don't think, I'm not talking about just wiping Labor and just saying, well, in 1949, you put the troops into the coal fields. I mean, that's obviously a long time ago now, but how do we handle it? How we handle it is, again, having strong social movements. That's when we get the best outcomes out of the Greens and the best outcomes out of Labor. Seriously, that's what it goes back to time and time again, supporting those movements. And there is, while we're not where um, they are in England, where they, with the um, rise um, following the um, leading into the last general election in, um, um, in England and what we've seen, seen and are seeing in the United States, there is a growth in social movements here. The National Day of Union Action is coming up on the 18th of October, and I would really urge that we all get behind that. There, um, th th and coming up um, th this, this week, I've just got to work out the dates, yes, um, Make Education Free Again, a big campaign coming out of our universities. Let's remember we had free higher education. It infuriates so many people that now those of us who benefited, um, you know, what, what's happening now for young people who have their right? And free higher education is spreading around the world and again an area where the Greens, where, <laughs> where the government is so far behind. Uh, and, th and then they, I'd really urge you to go down to Martin Place, a huge tent city of, of people who are homeless down there. Like these are where we can all take our stand with different movements that I hope in time come together. For the Greens, um, our role is very much one we see ourselves as giving support to these movements and being a part of the movements. And as I, I said earlier, and I'll repeat, that's what will put pressure on Labor. Can we ensure that this time, when Labor goes into government, and they could this time round, or we could have a hung, hung um, parliament like we've had before, that Labor will ta ta say, stay true to the policies that we're hearing talking about. And it's not beyond the realms of possibility that someone like ACTU Secretary Sally McManus will establish a militant reputation, go into politics, and be the standard bearer for radicalism. Their words that Hall Greenland recently wrote. There, there could be truth in that. But again, this is what the, is on the agenda. These are the conversations we need to have because it is a possibility. Because on the other side of the ledger, there is this huge collapse in the confidence in our political institutions, including on the left. Like, um, numbers in political parties are barely growing and many of them are going backwards. Um, so, what do we do? Again, I'm putting my eggs in the basket for the strengths of social movements. I think that's where the roots of many of us lie. Um, yes, we'll have our robust discussions, as they say these days, but let's not make them divisions and the um, backward steps that we've taken in the past. We are at the point of an uncertain future. Um, with possible social and ecological catastrophe. And that's why I've given emphasis to the need for us to be backing social movements, supporting them. Um, yes, there will continue to be single issue campaigns, but in time we need to see how that needs to address a vision for a new society. The Western model of global capitalism is breaking up. The US as a superpower, that era is over. They're on the downward slide. Trump, Clinton, whoever it might, may be, that, or even Obama, the era is over. The global social order is changing. Our challenge is to, to ensure that the direction of the change is for people and the planet. Thank you very much.